Okay, so now we've got the candidates for Vice President Academic Representation. Uh, thanks for coming in. Hello. Okay, so we've got uh, Zaino Farr, we've got Ogechi Aida, we've got Elliot O'Brant, and we've got Josh Dixon. Thanks very much for coming. Um, so, first of all, you must all be quite um, apprehensive. You really want to get going now. It's one o'clock today. Um, so, what's the plan? One o'clock comes. What's going on? Uh, Josh Dixon, do you want to Sorry. Um, yeah, it's kickoff basically. Um, get as many people, hopefully, as I know out as possible, spreading the message, getting publicity materials up, and just go, really. Excellent. Elliot, how are you? Um, just go on a mad dash around, um, try take up the best spaces, you know, yeah. Yeah, fight people with. Like nail and tooth, but yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not literally. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, um, Yeah, just um, going live with everything you've been PM, just um, getting it out there. Um, yeah. It's a bit, it's a bit of a release, isn't it? You know, it's, it's it kind is. of a, a relief to get you know started. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. I think um, I'm hoping it to be as much fun as it was the last few years, and everyone mm -hmm. just goes out, and a lot of students actually engage with us because we've all worked very hard, I believe. Excellent. So it brings me, you know, on to my first question, which would be why uh, Vice President Academic Representation. Uh, I'll, I'll start from uh, from Josh and go through. So Josh, why VP? I think because the role, it, it's, for me, it's central to the work that the union does because at the end of the day, we are here to, to study, we are here for academic purposes. And I think this role is the best way to truly represent the interests of students whilst they're studying at Brunel. And for me, that, that was the sort of simple reason as to as for why I sort of approached this role in the first place. And it's, that's it, really, because I think it's it's the key role that that, that, that we have in this re this union, really. Okay, Elliot, why VPAL? Yeah, no, I agree with Josh. I think it's the most important vice presidential position in the union. And I think, for me personally, I wanted to apply for academic representation because I think that's where I'm best suited. Um, I'm very creative, but I'm very academic in my creativity. And I want to bring that creativity to the academic process of Bruno. I get you. Why VPN? Um, I would say, um, in addition to being um, a very central position in the union, and um, maybe having the skills and the abilities, you know you're personally <coughs> heated for it. Um, I think experience counts a lot. So from my first year, um, compared to everything else, um, that's something I got engaged with. So I was able to see practically, okay, I do like this, I do understand what's going on, might as well go for it. So the experience um, helped me decide. Excellent, Zay. The same question, so why VPA? Personally for me, academia is quite huge in my family. So when, like growing up, it was always like academics, academics, academics. So when Vice President Dem Representation came up, I ran for it last year and I lost to a great candidate. So I'll come back because I have the same vision and I have the same belief that as Vice President Dem Representation, I want to create a lot of tools for the students and that's why I'm here. Okay, so you've all pointed out uh, actually how academic the role is, um, and you're all from different schools. Um, but this this question is for everyone. You know, um, I'll start with saying. So, what were your last three grades at Brunel? Um, I had so far this year. I've got previews, so keep it up with a T one. <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, yeah. Okay, and I get you. Um, Mine's be a bit of mix. Um, a star, C minus, <laughs> a B. Um, okay. So it's in a way. I for me, I just think it's um, the effort you put in it, um, you get it back. Yeah. And then. Um, I think mine has been an A star, uh, no, well, an A plus, an A and an A minus. Um, I'm happy to say what my grades are in a second, but I, I think that's actually an inappropriate question. I think what this role is truly about is representing students. It doesn't matter if I'm the most academic person at this university or not. What matters is representing students and their needs in this role. Um, last okay, well, just, 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 just okay. to answer that, so um, you know, the reason I've asked the question is I've spoken to a lot of people, a lot of students actually. Yeah. You know, what what does the academic representation role mean to them? And, and you know, they they consistently you know come back to me with the, with the fact that actually it's an academic person that they want in the role okay. to represent students as a whole. Um, and so that's the reason I've asked the question. Yeah. Um, it is kind of just the question of you know how academic are you? Um, and I suppose you, you know you can choose to answer it however you wish. I don't feel that you need to answer um, with the grades, but, but you know, just you, you give me an yeah, idea. Yeah, um, you know, I've last last few grades I think have all been C's. If yeah, I'm honest, okay. I think yeah. yeah. Okay, so. That brings me on then to um, some points from your manifestos, because all of your manifestos were quite developed, definitely policy-led, um, uh, for sure. You say, I get you, that you want to enforce seminars. Yeah. Um, could you expand on that? I mean, what does that mean? Does that mean enforce them um, for courses and all modules, or does that mean students must attend them? Um, 
I think it depends. Um, seminars are already available in some certain modules and courses across campus. And um, some seminars are just um, not enough. Maybe there should be more. So um, for me, it's all about providing a platform where the student and the teachers can discuss, you can ask questions. It could be about a coursework you just got back. And rather than just having your feedback on the paper, you can discuss it. Um, so it, it, in a way, it could be um, for um, essay questions and things like that. So it's providing a platform where you can actually discuss and ask questions, make it more effective than what the status quo is. So it's the format of the seminar that appeals to you, and you think that the, the active discussion is something that all, all modules could benefit from. Is that, am I right in that? Um, to an extent, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Zane, you talk about um, actually having a dissertation weeks, you yeah. call it. Um, so actually having dedicated weeks in, um, I believe, the final year timetable to actually getting people from, you say, in your, in your manifesto, you know, the 3,000 word essays up until, you know, the 12,000 word dissertation. How would that impact upon a third year? So if you um, think about a third year's timetable, it's going to be, you know, quite, quite uh, intensive. To, to say the least, how would it work in reality? Because basically what would happen is there would be two weeks in academic year, which would be the second week of university and the second to last week of university. And that's why I propose the second to last week because of the second years who want to go away to their third year and actually have the tools. So when they go over the summer, they can start on their dissertation. The second week for students who are coming back from placement, for students who are coming back from a year out, from students who are moving from different births, just for students generally who didn't get that first opportunity, have another opportunity. There will be workshops and just, it, will be, it won't be dedicated to each school and each subject, but it will be general skills in terms of how to start. Like how, I find it so hard personally for me to pick a question and so on, so it will be just the skills and workshops based on the skills that they would need to move on. So it won't be the whole academic year, it will just be that one week where nothing's intense yet, and they can actually go in for the whole year and have the tools they need to get academic excellence and achieve. And I suppose there's a wider issue there at universities that a lot of people say there's you know there's a lot of emphasis on the dissertation and the written work. But I wonder what everyone thinks about about the emphasis on dissertation. So Josh, what do you think about the emphasis on one mode of kind of assessment for most students? Um, well, what do you mean? But the university's approach to it. Yeah. yeah. So you know, a lot of people say that there is two standard. You know, the dissertation is a written piece of, of, of yeah. work for all you know most students. You know, what are your thoughts on that kind of set structure to assessment? Um, do you think it should be more varied? I don't know. I'm just trying to get your your thoughts on, on that. Well, um, I, I I do drama obviously, and in the arts we have a choice between a practical dissertation and a written dissertation, and I think the choice is is good for our department at least, because we, we do get a sort of 30 to 70 split between written and practicals. Oh. And it does give students a chance to um, explore the skills they've learned. I imagine in engineering, where if you want to try out physically the formulas you've learned and stuff, it mm. might be beneficial to have a practical dissertation. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think that's interesting actually. I think on, on the course I do, I, I, I'm doing a written dissertation. But I think the idea that it, it can be varied, like as we see in, in other schools and other courses, I think at the end of the day, through someone's dissertation, I think what you need is to get the best work out of someone. And if we are possibly offering students a variation on that, if that's something that maybe could look, in, look into in the future, I think that's really good. So at the end of the day, we want, we want the best out of the students. And if they find that through a different creative medium, I don't think we should stop people from doing that. But um, I personally don't have an issue with, with doing a written dissertation. I think for some courses it's, it's necessary because mm -hmm. it's what we've been used to throughout, throughout the years. Um, like just from just quite like literally, so, some of our courses are just designated on reading. My course is just reading, mm -hmm. reading, and I have to produce an essay, I have to produce a dissertation written. And it just depends on what course you do. If your course offers it, I think you should more than take that opportunity if you want. But at the end of the day, the written dissertation is some people might do drama and so on, but they want to get into writing scripts rather than acting, so that's good that they get both. So for me personally, I think the university gives the same opportunity to everyone to do a written dissertation, and that's, yeah. 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 I mean, um, this question does link to one of my manifesto points about um, giving final years the timing they need, um, just the best structure to get things done. So whether they be practical dissertation or written, like just reading and having to write, um, because if the university were to provide maybe more avenues of um, doing your final year project, um, it would come from if we see that our competitive universities have something else for their final years. If they don't, 
then I believe our practical ways and writing is still brilliant. You just have to work on the timing and help final years, you know, have the best they can, so they can give the best as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, both Elliot and Josh, you mentioned the library in your manifesto. Um, yes. Josh, you mentioned you want to protect um, the previous success that an incumbent in this role has had in securing uh, the library for a 24-hour opening during the week. Um, so this is just goes to show how powerful the role is. Um, you want to secure that, you want to make sure that that's safe. Uh, and then Elliot, you want to increase library standards. So I suppose just to open it into maybe into a bit of a discussion between yourselves, uh, how do they how do they connect? So you, you've got very much a protective kind of stance on, on keeping it as it is, and then and in, uh, trying to improve library standards. When I say improve, I, it's maintain and improve. I think the library is of a brilliant standard, but it's when it's when you're looking in the library and required reading for your course is not there. That's when you get these hidden course costs, which people who are paying nine thousand pounds a year for their course do not need to go and buy an extra textbook. So I talk quite a, quite a lot about hidden course costs. That's one of your main yeah. manifesto pledges. And <laughs> um, so I, I suppose maybe you could add a few points there. Yeah, I think what Elliot was saying actually is is incredibly important. I think to say, I, I'm, when I say protecting the library, what I'm specifically talking about is the library hours that we have now. That is what I want okay. to protect. And, and if we can extend library hours and weekends wherever we can, and I think that's something we should really try and get going. Um, in relation to um, Co uh, hidden course costs, um, that's the key number one thing that's going to be central to my campaign because when students are coming to university, um, Brunel fails students really, like they fail students on being upfront with the sort of costs that students incur when they come to university. It can be anything from anything silly as stationary to the books they purchase right up to how much it's going to cost them to go on placement or something like when you're getting a CRB checked, um, software and, and programs that people have to purchase their computers on certain courses. And the, the university, the fact that they're not upfront about this, I, I, we can deal with the fact that they're not including them in the costs already paying. But the fact that the university is not upfront with students about potentially thousands of pounds that the students are going to be spending, I, it's, I think it's disgusting because people are not told about this and it's a huge financial burden for a lot of people. Uh, for a lot of people. Just really quickly, what does everybody else think about that? I mean, you know, did you encounter hidden course costs? And you know, is it an issue that you feel needs to be changed? Um, um, personally for me, I think you're always expected to buy books. Like the library, fair enough, they only can allocate a certain amount of course books. I find myself, if you go there early, you get the books that you want. And if you reserve them, you end up getting them. But it's just depending on how, how eager you are as an individual. There's about Ten books each, maybe on each module. Yeah, if you're it's not a point, your head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 I do agree with saying like, that. But my only issue are. with the library is, is not the books. For me, the issue with the library comes with the journals. That the fact that the library itself doesn't offer journals to like recent journals. The journals they offer is just the first edition, and that's what they do. The first volume. They don't offer an extensive. It feels like it's just an abstract. Which is Elliot, Elliot. yeah. Well, one of my policies about improving the library facilities is the e-catalog. And when you search in the e-catalogue, if you can't find the journal you want for free or the book you want, yeah. I want there to be a submit form where students can suggest a relevant book or a relevant journal, journal article, which will then get sent off to their school librarian who will assess the relevancy and hopefully get that in the library within the week for that student. Because it's, it's unacceptable that journal articles, we have to pay for them. I had to pay... £30 yeah. for a journal article. Um, and my second just on that point as well, um, when it comes to books as well, the only, the biggest hidden cost within the library is the fact that I think, I believe some of the fines should be frozen at a certain time because students can't afford to just it's accumulate. Great. It's like sometimes we forget, sometimes we just tend to like, we need the book and they expect to return, we have an essay due in and we can't extend it. And the one day loan books, I don't think it should be that much money for you to pay if it's late after 1pm. Mm -hmm. That's Definitely. That's absolutely disgusting and it is ridiculous to have that amount of money to expect students to pay. Okay, thank you. So some great debate points there and gives us a real flavour of what we're <laughs> in, in store for over the next week. Um, so you've now got a chance just to really very quickly uh, give Brunel students a reason why they should vote for you. We're going to start with Elliot, um, if you could. Um, so you can deliver it to the camera or you can oh, just say it to Christ. me, however you want to do it. So literally, what, what, what's, why, what's the standard there, George? Why do you feel... <laughs> that, which way? Well, yeah, however you wish to. <laughs> why do you feel Brunel students should vote? Um, I feel I offer something completely different to the role. Um, my academics stem from an early age and I, my first love was maths and my second love's drama and I, 
I, I could have gone either way, and I, I'm just really interested in helping people learn. Okay, and I get you. Um, I would say because my vision is is plain, it's just to make Brunel University the most desirable place to come to study um, for those near and those far away. Okay, and Josh? Um, I think I stand out because I, since the moment I came to Brunel and became a part of the Students' Union, it became my priority that I would be here to represent students. I was, within a week of coming to Brunel, I was elected as a course rep, it was a, a couple of weeks. And um, I think I'm the only candidate who is taking seriously because I've outlined it in my manifesto, the issue of hidden course costs. This is an extremely important issue, and if you want someone who's going to lead on this and lobby hard on this, then I would really seriously urge students to get behind the campaign and vote, and vote for me. And Zane? Um, you should vote for me because I see the role as not just attending meetings or lobbying the university, I see it as creating academic tools and giving students the platform to achieve academic excellence. So when they actually, in turn, leave Brunel, they leave, they leave with achieving the academic goals. And if you look at my manifesto points, it's dissertation weeks, that is an academic platform I want to create. As that's an academic tool I want to create. If you look at the academic development plan, there will be tools within that as well that I want to create for students to actually move on and get the best goal, get the best academic grades they can, and in turn, Brunel achieve academic excellence. Thanks very much. And I must point out as well that two candidates could be with us for this video. Um, they are uh, Mohammed uh, Taran, uh, Tarunwani and um, Zariab Birajani, uh, who couldn't be with us. So that all of their um, manifestos are on the website. Um, and you can access them um, whenever you want right now. Um, or you could attend the question times, which are going to be uh, Monday and Tuesday of the coming week. So if you can attend those, um, then do so. Thanks very much for coming and best of luck, guys. Thanks. 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 Cheers.